Hi, welcome to my ECG video blog. I'm Ken Grauer, and this is my 14th ECG video blog. Today's topic is Brugada syndrome. My goal is to simplify this topic. What is Brugada syndrome? How do we recognize the various Brugada ECG patterns? When can you be comfortable managing the patient on your own? And who needs referral? As always, for your convenience, I've made a website that lists key links to my ECG blog, my video blogs, and my introductory and advanced books and EPUBs on ECG interpretation. My email address is ekgpress at mac.com. Please write me with your comments, feedback, and questions. On to today's topic. Let's begin with a case. How would you interpret this 12-lead ECG? As you contemplate your answer, what is missing? What's missing is a history. How old is the patient? Is the patient male or female? And we need to know why the ECG was done. Given what we see on this ECG, it is especially relevant to know if the reason this patient presented for care was syncope, or perhaps chest pain, or some episode with loss of consciousness. We also need to know about the patient's family history. Was there a sudden death at an early age in any close relative? Let's now look closer at the key part of the tracing which will magnify to get an even better look. Doesn't the downslope of the ST segment in leads V1 and V2 remind you of a very steep ski slope? Red arrows. As you may have guessed, this ECG is highly suggestive of Brugada syndrome. That said, technically, I would do better to describe this ECG as being diagnostic of a type 1 Brugada pattern. Brugada syndrome is only present if, in addition to a diagnostic type 1 ECG pattern, there are also clinical features, such as a history of cardiac arrest or polymorphic VT, or a history of non-vasovagal syncope, a positive family history of sudden death at an early age that is not due to acute MI, or the finding of a similar type 1 ECG pattern in one or more close relatives. In contrast to the diagnostic type 1 ECG pattern that is present in both leads V1 and V2 of this tracing, is the non-diagnostic ST-T wave appearance that we see in lead V3. This shape of the ST segment is known as a saddleback deformity because the ST segment and T wave resemble the shape of a saddle with a smoothly scooped segment in between two small humps where the rider sits. That's the shape of the ST-T wave that we see here in lead V3. This ST segment shape is known as a type 2 Brugada pattern. If seen by itself in V1, V2, or V3, it would not be diagnostic of Brugada syndrome, but it may suggest that Brugada syndrome still could be present if a diagnostic type 1 pattern was to be seen at another time. That said, in this case, the presence of a saddleback pattern in lead V3 is superfluous because we already have diagnostic type 1 changes in not only one lead, but in both leads V1 and V2. So what is Brugada syndrome? Brugada syndrome is an inherited heart disorder without structural abnormality. It is thought to arise from a problem with sodium channel current flow, hence referral to the syndrome as a channelopathy. Specifically, there is thought to be an accelerated inactivation of sodium channels, which results in development of a predominant transient outward potassium current. This may set up a myocardial cell voltage gradient that is primarily found within right ventricular myocardial layers, 
which explains why ECG abnormalities are primarily seen in right ventricular leads, that is V1, V2, V3. The clinical concern is that formation of this transient voltage gradient may trigger episodes of ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. The clinical problem is that Brugada ECG patterns may be dynamic, that is, intermittent, sometimes seen in their full form, known as Brugada 1 ECG pattern, or sometimes only seen in a non-diagnostic or partial form, which is the Brugada 2 or Saddleback pattern. And sometimes patients with Brugada syndrome may not manifest any ECG abnormality at all at the time an initial ECG is done. To further complicate diagnosis, various Brugada ECG patterns may only be brought out by other ongoing conditions. This is important clinically because intermittent or induced Brugada patterns generally do not manifest the same adverse prognostic implications as are seen in patients with a persistent type 1 pattern. On ECG, as we have already mentioned, abnormalities are best seen and often only seen in the upper chest leads, which overlie the right ventricular outflow tract which corresponds anatomically to the location of the abnormal voltage gradient. But what concerns us the most is the clinical significance and the risk of VT or VFib for the patient in front of us. We emphasize that this risk depends on a series of factors, including whether the Brugada ECG pattern is spontaneous and persistent versus being intermittent and or induced by other transient conditions, whether the patient is symptomatic, for example, with syncope, and family history of sudden death or family history of unexplained syncope at an early age. Clinical expression of Brugada syndrome has a male predominance. There is genetic predisposition. The syndrome displays autosomal dominant transmission, which means that it is easy to pass on the trait for Brugada from parent to child. That said, the genetics are complicated, with more than 160 mutations having been discovered, with the bottom line that many persons with the gene for Brugada do not clinically express the syndrome. Among those who do express the syndrome, electrical and ECG abnormalities are far more common in males, although it is not exactly known why perhaps due to different properties in sodium channel modulation. But the point to remember is that you'll find clinical expression of Brugada syndrome up to 10 times more often in males. What then are some of the reasons why you may see a Brugada type 2 or even type 1 pattern some of the time, but not always? Among the most common precipitating factors are drugs or other substances, so much so that part of the evaluation when assessing patients and risk stratifying them may include response to certain provocative agents. The list of drugs shown here is partial, with the point to remember simply being that pharmacologic agents may sometimes induce Brugada ECG patterns. The list of other factors on this slide that may intermittently induce Brugada ECG patterns is also only partial. Rather than trying to memorize this continually expanding list, it is better to simply be aware of the problematic and intermittent nature of ECG findings that some patients with Brugada syndrome may manifest. And then there is the so-called Brugada phenocopy, in which a type 1 Brugada ECG pattern is seen in association with one or more of the factors on this slide, say during an acute febrile illness, with acute myocardial infarction, or right after electrical cardioversion. With these ECG abnormalities then going away once the precipitating factor resolves, such patients appear to be far less likely to have a Brugada gene mutation, and their prognosis is generally better than for patients with persistent spontaneous type 1 changes. Finally, 
there is the concept that repositioning the recording electrodes for leads V1 and V2 may bring out Brugada type 1 or type 2 ECG changes. The reason for this relates to our prior discussion, namely that the abnormal voltage gradient is generally seen in the area of the right ventricular outflow tract which is sometimes best visualized by slightly higher placement of leads V1 and V2. While good to know about this diagnostic maneuver, my preference is not to make a habit of doing multiple ECGs on all patients with equivocal ECG findings. For example, I prefer not to explore what the ECG might look like for a patient with a type 2 Brugada pattern that I thought was related to hypokalemia since the ECG is likely to normalize with potassium replacement. On the other hand, I'd be much more inclined to redo the ECG with V1-V2 repositioning in a young male who presents to the ED with unexplained syncope. So, clinically, what should we do? The answer depends on the clinical situation as well as on what your role and level of experience with Brugada syndrome is. My training is as a primary care physician, so that's the perspective I use to make this video. So whether you are working in a primary care setting or seeing a patient who presents to the emergency department, the clinical issues for the non-cardiologist are when to refer to EP, that is to an electrophysiology cardiologist, and whether the patient is likely to need an ICD, implantable cardioverter defibrillator. Consider scenario one, in which there is transient induction of a type two Brugada ECG pattern that is only briefly seen during an acute febrile illness in an otherwise healthy young adult who has a negative family history. Imagine the patient's ECG looks like this and essentially normal tracing with type 2, that is saddleback, ST elevation seen in leads V2 and V3. If I was the treating clinician, I would probably not pursue this ECG finding, especially if the type 2 pattern completely resolved on follow-up. Contrast this with situation 2, in which the patient is older, and presents with syncope and a positive family history. If the patient in this second case had an ECG that looks like this, with typical type 1 ski slope rapid descent of the ST segment, there should be little doubt about the need for referral. That said, in real life, it is usually not this easy. Most patients will not present with both symptoms and a typical diagnostic type 1 Brugada ECG pattern. So judgment is needed. Along the way, you can take comfort in the clinical reality that your cardiologists will not always agree on each case. This leads me into the next issue, which is appreciating what Brugada syndrome is not. Brugada syndrome is not lead misplacement. It's amazing how common misplacement of the chest leads is in everyday practice. The key for proper placement is to identify the angle of Lewis, which is the horizontal ridge below the manubrial notch of the upper sternum. Just below this horizontal ridge lies the second intercostal space. Inching down two interspaces below this, we arrive at the fourth intercostal space. The electrode for recording lead V1 is placed in this fourth intercostal space just to the right of the sternum. Just to the left of the sternum, in the fourth intercostal space, is the location for lead V2. Unfortunately, that's not what happens much of the time in real life even when experienced personnel is charged with recording the ECG. All too often, lead V1 is placed in the third intercostal space, or sometimes even in the second intercostal space, with lead V2 placed right beside it. The good news is that it will often be easy to recognize when chest lead placement is too high, 
simply from looking at the P wave and QRS complex in lead V1. If you see an R prime complex in lead V1, especially in association with a predominantly negative P wave in lead V1, then the chest leads have probably been placed one or two interspaces too high. I'll emphasize that the finding of an RSR prime complex in lead V1, or even of an incomplete right bundle branch block pattern, which I define as an RSR prime in V1 with narrow terminal S waves in leads 1 and V6, is not necessarily abnormal. Many interpreters view these findings as normal variants because of how commonly they are seen, even when chest leads are properly placed. We'll see in a moment an easy way to distinguish these findings from the Type 2 Brugada saddleback pattern. Just two more points before we get to that. An RSR prime may also be seen in lead V1 in patients with chest deformities, such as pectus excavatum. And well-trained athletes may sometimes also show ECG findings of delayed right ventricular activation. This is especially true of endurance athletes because of the physiologic right ventricular enlargement they develop. Some of these endurance athletes may develop a surprisingly tall R prime wave, sometimes with slight ST elevation in V1 and often with T wave inversion in this lead. Let's put these concepts together with a practice tracing. How would you interpret this ECG? obtained from an asymptomatic young adult. The patient had come in for a pre-participation sports evaluation and an ECG was part of the routine at the facility where he was being seen. We won't debate the controversial issue of whether screening ECGs should or should not be done on such individuals, but instead just say that an ECG was done. Family history was negative for cardiac disorders. Assuming that physical examination was normal and that there was no history of exercise-related syncope, should this young adult be cleared to participate in vigorous sports? What would you do if you were the clinician taking care of him? The ECG shows sinus rhythm at a rate just under 60 per minute and is otherwise normal, with the exception of the anterior chest leads, which I'll magnify so that we can take a closer look. The leads of interest are V1 and V2. Note the RSR prime complex in lead V1. Is this consistent with a type 1 Brugada ECG pattern? The answer is no. The R prime is narrow and we lack the ski slope steep descent that is characteristic of Brugada type 1 patterns. In addition, there is a slight negative component to the P wave in lead V1. So it may also be that leads V1 and V2 were positioned too high on the chest. Let's now focus on lead V2. In addition to the RSR prime complex that we also see in this lead, isn't there a saddleback shape to the ST segment in lead V2? Is this truly a Brugada type 2 ECG pattern, or is it simply an RSR prime variant that is not really abnormal in this athletic and asymptomatic young adult? Would you evaluate this further, or would you ignore these ECG findings and clear this individual for full participation in vigorous sports? This takes us a bit beyond the core in our discussion of Brugada syndrome, but I want to introduce what I find as an excellent and surprisingly easy way to answer the questions I posed on the previous slide. This table summarizes it all. Here is the reference for this table, developed by a group of esteemed international cardiologists who published their excellent consensus report in the Journal of Electrocardiology. As you can see, the details get quite technical. The good news is that a picture tells a thousand words, so I'll simplify the contents of this table over the next few minutes.
Let me emphasize that if ever you are in doubt about what to do for a patient with a possible Brugada ECG pattern, refer the case to one of your cardiology colleagues. That said, my hope is that I can make you more comfortable in your assessment over the next few minutes. Use of the beta angle may help. What do I mean by this? On the left, we see the diagnostic picture of type 1 Brugada ECG changes. Here is the pattern in red. Compare this to the ECG pattern of right bundle branch block in green. Let me superimpose these two patterns. Note that at 80 milliseconds, that is two small boxes later, that with the type 1 Brugada pattern, the ST segment is still significantly elevated above the baseline, red arrow. Compare this to what happens with right bundle branch block in green, in which the ST segment has long ago returned to the baseline, if not descended below the baseline with some ST depression. Now consider what happens with the type 2 Brugada pattern, or saddleback abnormality. These are the numerical criteria, but my animated illustration should simplify. Here is a Brugada type 2 pattern in blue. Compare this to the ECG pattern of right bundle branch block in green. Let me again superimpose these two patterns. Rather than the very tall and peaked T wave I initially drew in blue, I'll show the more common lesser peaked T wave that is usually seen with a saddleback pattern. Once again, note that at 80 milliseconds, that is two small boxes later, that with the type 2 Brugada pattern, the ST segment is still elevated above the baseline, whereas with right bundle branch block, in green, the ST segment has not only returned to the baseline, but descended below it with some ST depression. Let's look closer at how to assess for a saddleback pattern. The beta angle holds the key. This is what is meant by the beta angle, red arc. To distinguish between normal RSR prime variants and what constitutes a true type 2 Brugada saddleback pattern, one draws a vertical line from the peak of the R prime wave. This vertical line, shown here in red, should be 5 millimeters long, or one large box in duration. One then follows the slope of the initial descending portion of the ST segment from this R prime peak as shown by the second red arrow that I have drawn in. If the base of the triangle formed by these two red arrows is more than four millimeters long, then you have a true Brugada type two saddleback pattern. So if we return to the right bundle branch block RSR prime complex in green and drop a vertical line five millimeters down from the R prime wave and follow the slope of the descent of the ST segment after the R prime, as shown by the second red arrow, we can see that the base of the triangle formed is nowhere near the required four millimeter duration. This handy four millimeter rule gives us concrete criteria for why right bundle branch block is not a Brugada ECG pattern. Let's go back and apply this information to the case of the asymptomatic young adult we were just discussing. The patient was in for a pre-participation sports physical. Family history was negative, and we were asked to decide if we should clear the patient to participate in unrestricted vigorous physical activity. His 12-lead ECG was normal with the exception of what we see in leads V1 and V2. First question, is the RSR prime pattern that we see in lead V1 suggestive of a type 1 Brugada ECG change? 
Here's a reminder of what a diagnostic type 1 Brugada ECG pattern looks like in red. So the answer is no. With a type 1 Brugada ECG pattern, the downsloping ST segment should still be elevated at 0.08 second, or for at least two little boxes after the peak of the R prime wave. In this case, the R prime is extremely narrow. It is virtually straight up and down without any appreciable beta angle. So we can definitely say that a type 1 Brugada ECG pattern is not present. How about the ECG appearance in lead V2? Is there a saddleback or Brugada type 2 ECG pattern? Remember the beta angle. We drop a 5 mm vertical line from the peak of the R prime and then follow the angle from this R prime peak. If the base of the triangle formed by these two lines is 4 mm or more, then we have a true type 2 saddleback pattern. That is not what we have here in lead V2. Instead, the beta angle is narrow and the base of the triangle formed is clearly less than four millimeters long. So the answer is yes, we would clear this asymptomatic young adult for full unrestricted physical activity, since neither a type one nor type two Brugada pattern is present. We conclude this ECG video with this final clinical example. The patient presented with an acute inferior ST elevation myocardial infarction. The rhythm is sinus and there is ST elevation in each of the inferior leads. We see reciprocal ST depression in lead AVL. There is also ST depression in lead V2 consistent with acute posterior involvement. Let's magnify the key leads of interest. We clearly see the already tall R wave and ST segment depression in lead V2, consistent with acute posterior involvement. But what's going on in lead V1? Is this a Brugada pattern? If so, what is its significance in the setting of an acute myocardial infarction? Against this being a true Brugada 1 pattern is the absence of the usual 2 millimeters or more of ST segment elevation in at least one of the anterior leads. On the other hand, if we look at the angle, it looks close. Perhaps if this ECG was repeated, repositioning leads V1 and V2 one or two interspaces higher, we might then see a more typical Brugada 1 pattern with more ST elevation in lead V1. Bottom line, we would not reposition the leads for a repeat ECG on this patient because it probably does not matter if a type 1 Brugada pattern is present or not. The patient has an acute inferior posterior infarction. Priorities for management should clearly be directed at stabilization and acute reperfusion. Cardiac catheterization would be considered regardless of whether or not a Brugada 1 pattern is present. And the chances are good that the Brugada-like changes that we see in V1 might resolve once the acute ischemic episode is over. So, repeating the ECG at a later point in time is the path we would follow. That concludes this ECG video. Hopefully, you now feel more comfortable assessing for Brugada ECG changes. This is Ken Grauer saying goodbye for now. Du plus loin que me reviennent. 